Welcome to the Nitpicking Nerds. Today, we're talking about fun EDH, and more specifically, how to make your deck more fun. I'm your host, Joe Cherries. I'm your host, Beezy, and that makes us the Nitpicking Nerds. If you enjoy balancing your deck between casual and competitive, we do that a lot, so uh, subscribe. Uh, and besides, our subscribers are 10% more likely to have a 10% more fun deck 10% of the time. Hello there. Disclaimer man here. I'm here to inform you the nitpicky nerds cannot legally guarantee that you will have more fun. Okay, so what is this What is this video about? Uh, this video is we're going only into the deck building process. There are obviously more ways when playing a game of EDH and things along those lines, but we're going into the deck building process, cards you can put in, ways to play the game that make it more fun in our opinion, obviously. I don't know why. We do have to preface that because I feel like people... This is the internet. Yeah, people just be like, I don't feel like that's more fun. Well, it's in my opinion. In fact, there's a bit at the end of this where me and BZ are going to disagree on whether we think that is more fun or not. But anyway, the main reason we're making this video is there's... I've seen so many questions all over the internet on Reddit and even Facebook and just DMs to us. that People are wondering how to make their deck that is super strong less competitive they want to make it more fun because the problem they're having is oh i always get targeted I, i'm not having fun people don't want to play against me it's always arch enemy i can't you know make another deck and come in with it it's like well we're going to answer some of those questions if you have those questions i have to imagine almost all of them will be answered yeah and this is and this is one of the best ways to do it because through the deck building process you take out a lot of the arch enemy thing because mm -hmm. if your deck is built to be more fun then people won't come after you and you'll have more fun. I mean, there's, there are play patterns that you're going to have to sort of like work out. If people always target you, well, if you're going to build this new deck or tune your deck down, you get to play a few games before they realize they don't have to target you. Yeah, and it's not more fun to play a super competitive deck and then choose not to win. I, I have done that. It's actually the worst. It's not fun. It's like, like the lesser of two evils. I, I've had it to where I could win for the fourth time in a row, but I just don't. And then I'm like, I'm not really enjoying this. They don't really know. It doesn't feel good. Yeah, you don't want to be doing that. So the first thing we're going to get into to make your deck more fun through deck building is increasing variance. We're not talking about play chaos warps and warp world and things that say the word random on them. It, it's more of embrace variance. EDH is a 99 card format. Everything has to have a different name. So what can we do to take that and sort of twist the deck that we already have that we say, hey, this deck is too strong, or I want to make this deck more fun. How do we twist that? So we want to avoid doing the same thing every game or the same combos every game. Things that are very, very much the same every single game. Because well, it just you can have a game plan, like fill my graveyard, bring back creatures. But if your game plan is entomb Protean Hulk, reanimate Protean Hulk, that is so obvious to everyone, and it's very frustrating when it just... That that's the play. That's the only thing that ever happens. That's the play pattern that happens every single game. A lot of like, if your deck has no other way to win than to just do a whole combo every game, you're going to fall into very stale gameplay patterns, and your opponents aren't going to have fun because they know they have to stop you, and then you're not going to have fun if they're all stopping you. Yeah. And one last disclaimer that I want to put right now because there's there's always there's always the people who are trying to say that we're talking about CDH or EDH. This is EDH. CDH. I mean, how could you ever complain about you know, there's a different staleness is fun. Okay, this is EDH. We're talking about EDH. When bringing, we're not talking about bringing CDH to EDH and pub stomping. We're not talking about that. We're just talking about you have four EDH decks. Whether or not you're playing competitive, doesn't matter. It's you have to be asking why is my deck not fun and yeah. how do I make it better. Well, it does matter if you're playing competitive. That's fine. Like it's like we're not talking sure. about that. Yeah, it does. It does. If you're only playing to win. This really isn't going to help. We're talking about decks that are more down near than 90%. Right. Or you have that deck and you want to tone it down to play with your other play group. Yes. Because maybe maybe they have an 80% deck. Yeah, just I like... had to get that out of there because I feel like it was better to said now than later. So, uh, so uh, yeah, playing decks, we said playing decks only one win condition is just going to make the game super stale. Yeah. If you're exactly, if you're doing the exact same thing every single game, and that's the only way you can possibly win. Like we said, super stale. It's also Eliminate... predictable. If your opponents are losing, they go, all right, here comes Omniscience or... Here comes this thing. Here comes the reanimation spell. I uh, just know it, and that's not going to be fun for them. So, and even in those decks, another way, say you want to play something that its specific win condition is always to maybe mill itself. Maybe yeah. that's its win condition. A way to make that 
uh, more exciting is to play less tutors because now your deck wants to do that, has to get there, but you might have to take a lot of different lines because you can't just go, well, now I can just tutor for the best card of a deck every single game, put it out, do my game plan, win the same way. A lot of groups have tutors sort of soft banned because they take, they take away so much of the tension of Commander. Like, oh, I didn't draw any removal. I got to do something. It's like, well, now I have a board wipe or I have a card draw spell or I have my combo piece or yeah, tutors are just insanely strong. Even at the janky, like, five mana tutors, it's still really good. No, oh, I love fair. I think the most fair thing is, like, a five mana tutor. Because, like, this, we think about what tutors are. Uh, two mana, like, demonic tutors, two mana, for, and then the best spell in your deck is Your called. best possible line plus two mana. Yeah, it's like, that's insane. Like, five mana, it's like, okay, now your best possible line plus five mana, that's a lot to Okay, so you could increase the mana of your tutors. Maybe uh, the first one that comes to mind is the five mana tutor that cycles for black. Razaketh's... Yeah. Right or something. Yeah. Another one that I, I really like as a tutor is um, Dark Petitions. Like, it is very similar to... Um, oh, but then you have to meet a little hoop. But you you have to go through a little hoop. Or it's to, like a bad card. It makes your deck a little cooler, a little different, and you have to be playing. Or it's a bad tutor, and the bad tutor is more fair, and you're playing a more fair game. Right. But I think you could, if you're going, if you want to say, hey, how do I spice this deck up? Well, the first, here's going to free up, you know, up to 10 slots as you take out Link Tutor and Vampiric Tutor and Demonic Tutor, and just the ones that are just, there's no tension. It's strictly a power card. You know, no one really has fun casting Demonic Tutor. That, you know, it's not, there's not any fun in the card. It's more of what you get with it. Yeah. So um, you just cut that out. You can even replace it with card draw. You can replace it with a lot of stuff that we're about to recommend. Yeah. I think we're, so we're, we're like uh, up near the end of competitive, where we just have a lot of tutors, I've realized. Like, well, we play, just we play stronger decks. I don't know. Yeah. And uh, so another thing, for fun here, putting in your deck, avoid the staples, avoid the huge swing ones specifically. Crater of Behemoth, Cyclonic Rift, they're great examples of like cards that are always this huge swing. Uh, Crater of Behemoth probably more fits into the w winning the same way every time category. A lot of decks just tutor up Crater Hoof. It's, but it's such a swingy card. Play Crater Hoof, I don't even have a good board. Kill someone, just kill one player. It's over for them. I, this, the, per the amount of times someone has Cyclonic Rift and I know they have Cyclonic Rift and I know they don't have anything else and I still can't do anything about it, has probably happened a dozen times. It is very annoying. It is not fun. It's just kind of like, that's not miserable, but I just don't get any enjoyment out of that turn, two, two, turn, two turn cycle where I force them to play it and then get blown out by it. Yeah, the thing about Cyclonic Rift is it falls down into a category where it's like, it's not quite in the competitive category. Yeah, it's and not it falls, the best card in CDH. And that, but then it falls down to like, it's not very good in CDH. And then as soon as you hit the 90%, the card is busted and insane and so it's stupid. It's ridiculous. I've taken out a lot of the decks I build. I haven't built... I haven't put it into a deck in a long time, and I don't regret it. It's been it's been a positive change in my decks to not play it. Yeah, sometimes that card, uh, Cyclonic Rift feels bad on some decks if your deck isn't good at getting card advantage, and sometimes that happens. Well, where you play Cyclonic Rift and all it does is set the game back a turn. Yeah, so and then like, you get to the next turn, it's the same game. It's like a fog. Yeah, it's like it fogged. For it's a like team. the weirdest fog. It's like uh, it fogged every player because now they have to reset and they can't. Nobody yeah. can attack that turn. Super random. Another way to increase fun. Don't make players at the table hate you. So That's such a weird way to word it. We didn't really come up with a final. We just, eh, don't make people hate you. That's not exactly what we mean. So, well, I mean, don't make the, the table, don't, you make yourself an enemy. Don't, because, ir don't irritate them. Yeah, don't irritate enemies, your enemies. Don't irritate your opponents with certain cards, such as, great example to start, stacks. Super commonly hated cards like Winter Orb, uh, things that are going to stasis, things that are going to prevent the game from really progressing, and instead they're just going to grind the game down to a halt, and nobody's playing Magic. Blood Moon is another great example. Yeah, take your if you have a stack deck and you love it, there's probably a time to play it. Don't you don't bring it out every other game. That's just not going to. That's not going to. When you're at EDH night, that's not going to make five games get played in EDH night. That's going to have two games get played, and I would so much rather play five games than two. Yeah, um, stacks again. Yeah, stack stacks are inherently like evil or bad but no if there's, nothing, there's nothing wrong with anyone who decides to play them but it's if you're playing in the wrong context you're not gonna have as much fun yeah and make sure you like if you're playing in a certain play group where it's like again i feel like sex falls into the part where it's like you want to play that like, it, with cdh sex you because like a, yeah because yeah. when you fall down into the 90 percent, you're just you, that's because 90 percent that means you're trying to have fun over winning at that point but you're just playing powerful decks but you're just playing a super powerful stack stack that is taking away fun i don't i feel like you would i want to avoid that it's almost like there's a curve or some kind of, we're like measuring fun. Stacks is net negative for fun. I mean, you know what else is net negative for fun? Land destruction. Land destruction. Blowing up all lands. 
I'm okay with it as a win condition. I don't really have a problem with it. Uh, if you're going to, you know, blow me out by blowing up all my lands and then, okay, I can't win now because you have Lord Windgrace out, I'll just scoop. That's fine. Yeah. You like, win the game. As a win condition, completely reasonable. It's a, it's a way to win the game. You can take everyone else and then you're just going to be the one who wins. Also, single target land destruction is a thing and every deck should have it. And so many decks get to get away with little shenanigans because of their stupid, you know, they play 35 lands and now What's nobody a, wants to interact with it. We're talking about mass land destruction. Right. Mass land destruction for the sake of slowing the game down or because you're behind or not out of spite because just don't make any spiteful plays because that's stupid. Well, yeah. Yeah, don't be spiteful. In the eights. That's that's actually a tip. That's for, how you not have fun. That's a not even a deck building tip. That's just a life tip. Yeah, don't be but don't be spiteful overall. Yeah, overall that's probably a good tip. Yeah, that's even that's a non magic tip. Yeah, just don't be You're spiteful. Welcome. Yeah, uh, counter spells. Uh, these are like having a few counter spells in your deck is great. They're basically removal. They're one for one, so you don't even want too many of them. They do have diminishing returns. They, if you play thirty counter spells in your deck. And you don't have some amazing like commander to protect. You're not really getting anywhere. You're just one for winning and losing card advantage. Yeah, exactly. So if you're running like we just put a number here, uh, something like five, more than five kind of spells, you can start cutting them for removal because players. Uh, this is a very strange thing, and I don't know. It's not. And again, this isn't inherently true to everybody. The average player hates getting their spell countered, as opposed to they play. Let's say they play. I don't know some big fat like Vorinclex. They, they play a Vorinclex and it just gets killed by like a, a, a Doom Blade. Blade. Wow, that was exactly what I was going to say. Oh, wow, the most prolific removal spell of all time. It's so weird. There's still a million other... Anyway, it we... dies to a Doom Blade. They would feel better on average than if it got countered. Yeah. For some reason. I don't know what it is, but that it's a little nugget in everyone's head. But I think you need counter spells in your blue decks. I've never really gone over five and I felt pretty good with the sweet spot. Yeah. I and usually I get... play like, all right, Swan Song, Arcane Denial, Counter Spell... Like Mystic Confluence and like Narset Reversal. Like those are the five I, I choose between. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and those those five are really good. You're mm -hmm. not gonna need. You just don't need a ton. Change the five counter spells six through ten to spot removal spells or board wipes or something else. Just a different way to interact to spice up how your deck, you know, interacts with the other decks. How are they relating? Yeah, because nobody wants to get every one of their spells countered, especially because I've been in the position where I've played like the, I want to play huge fun spells deck. Oh, but you're next to the counter spell player. But you're next so to when you're the player before the counter spell player, they, if they don't use their counter spells, you're the one who's going to get countered. It's like, well, there's just nothing I can do because my, I'm playing, I'm playing six, seven mana spells, but I'm not saying every deck should be like that, but I'm saying I ha I've had that deck and I've sat next to the guy with 10 counter spells. It's like, well, what do I ever do? It's you're at such a disadvantage just because of where you sat. Just because of and, because and of where because I of sat. Counterspells and where you sat and doesn't that doesn't sit well with a lot of people. Yeah, it just it feels bad. And I'm not again. You can build. You should sometimes avoid building your deck so big and swingy. But I had a big swingy deck. That's what I was doing for fun, and I couldn't sit next to a counterspells player because I would just die. Yeah. The next one we have is don't disrupt the balance and momentum of the game. And we're not talking about don't board wipe and you know ruin somebody's momentum. You have to. You're trying to win, and they're trying to win. It's more of the amount of time each turn takes, there's sort of a, like un... What is it? Un... I don't know. Oh, God. Unspoken okay. rule that this is a four-player game. Relatively, we're all going to spend the same amount of time playing this game. Everyone's turns should probably be a similar length. Obviously, the guy who goes, I missed my land drop, go. He can't do anything. But your turns shouldn't be cantrip, 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 untap my lands, time walk to me, untap go, dig, 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 time walk. Ugh. You're absorbing 50% of the game time instead of 25. Yeah, exactly. If when you start taking up more game time than everybody else, people start getting bored. A, a deck that goldfishes. So, for example, a combo that doesn't just outright win the game. Niv is a Perun with Curiosity on it doesn't outright win the game. It pretty much wins the game. You get to... Draw 40, kill someone, draw 40, kill someone, but now you have to like go through all these hoops and discard your, your Kozilek and shuffle it in and make sure you hold up removal spells just in case the last person has it. It's so many more steps than just, all right, guys, you're dead. Yeah. And it's like you, it's, I, combos that make the other, like the other players who don't want to lose play through them feels rough. Players, we've, I, we actually, I don't think, was this here? Because we, we said this. Players shouldn't have to scoop to you to save time. Oh, yeah. Players, I, yeah, the game shouldn't end because everyone scoops to you 
to save time because they want to get to the next game. That should really never be how games end. That's not true. Players should scoop to it's, you if they're dead. It's not It's not every time. But I'm saying if your deck, let's just say you're playing a deck where it's 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 pretty much you're 95% locked. That's that's like the number I'm at, where it's like you're a 95% locked to win this game. Just have the cards in your deck to correctly make sure it's 100%. I don't, 95% locks become the worst because now I don't want to scoop. Yeah, because I would so much rather be dead oh. than be scraping and like not liking this game and just, what, what do we got, guys? You got anything? No. Okay, it's Consecrated Sphinx stays out for another turn cycle. Something like that. Yeah, and what, oh, a great example of this and something that's rough to play against is anything that makes all players discard their hands. If no one's in a graveyard deck, <laughs> everyone's in top deck mode. It's so rough. Except it, for you and you're just going off. It reaches the game to a hole. And you're, again, you're not in that 100% to win category. No, because you're more in that. What if you draw lands and they draw a huge threat? And you're probably more in that 90% where it's like, oh my God, what am I supposed, what is anyone else supposed to do? They have to hope they draw. That's where players go, okay, let's just scoop. I want to get to the next game. That's not how. And that's not what you want to do because you want the game to actually be over. It's like, oh, that was crazy. I can't believe you did this. It's like, oh, it's, that was crazy. I can't believe you, you almost won, but then we scooped. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I can't believe, like, you put you put Sire of Insanity, you entombed Sire of Insanity on turn one. Wow, that was really fun. Nobody played Magic. Or you just played turn Sire, Sire of Insanity on turn eight. I guess, and nobody played Magic. I guess, like, to be fair, on turn one, I would consider that a win. If well, you, I'm just saying, if you do it on turn eight, is it really much different? Well, no, grind the game to hold on turn eight. No, yeah, no, I agree with that. I was saying, if actually, if you're able to do that in turn one, that's just actually winning. Because if, especially yeah. if you're on the play, nobody gets a land drop. Nobody gets a land. Like you just, you've won the game. That's fine. That's a. That's I, actually. I don't know how we're not playing CDH if you're doing that. Uh, <laughs> what are you doing? You mox a diamond. <laughs> that's fair. And tomb reanimate. Yeah, that's completely fair. Maybe it is just a CDH thing that could happen. <laughs> uh, we, one important way in gameplay, we're kind of mixing in deck building and gameplay, but you get you get which is which. Obviously, that's very. Obvious whether something is a gameplay tactic or a deck building tactic, but don't bully people. Well, to be to be fair, we are actually talking about deck building here, but we're talking about specific cards. The ones that come to mind specifically, and there are definitely other ones, um, are Mind Slaver. Two classics: Mind Slaver, Emrakul, The Promised End. Oh my God, they're miserable. You, they're, they're mis. They both have their own special one, but any sort of. Um, Mind Slaver. I have never played Mind Slaver or played against it, so like I don't have the hate for that card. It's different. It's similar, but it's its own different thing. It's it's annoying because you don't get an extra turn, but they can't necessarily like there's no thirteen thirteen. Yeah, but, and it's counterable. I mean, Mind Slaver is recurrable, so it doesn't matter which one's better. They're both miserable. It, yeah, it absolutely does not matter. So I have a special hate in my heart for Emrakul. It's my least favorite card in Commander. It has been for a while now, and I just can't stand it. If you get targeted by it, it feels horrible. Bad. I feel like, like, I don't know why. And maybe it's just because I've been lucky, or maybe you've been nice to me. But recently, I haven't been targeted by Emrakul. I don't, like I said, I don't know if I've been in a lucky position, or just if you were uh, not targeting me. I, I usually only, I have it in one deck, because I love that card. It's like a pet card. And I only ever target who's in first. Uh, that's the only way I can play that. That's the only way I can even justify that card. If I just, if I pick anyone who's not in first, I'm a monster. I have considered, um, like, I actually kind of want to do this. I hate the card so much. I would like to make it my commander and make a deck that's actually fun around it. Where it's like when I take your turn, I don't completely like I don't I'm not just nice to you, but I don't completely destroy you. Like maybe I just you just take their turn. You just take their turn. As well, if you, it was your turn. Like, yeah, but without it's like if they have necropotence, I'm not gonna kill them. I would never want to do that. That's okay. not fun. These cards are not fun. They bully people, they take people out of the game, and then that person is forced to sit there and watch three of their friends play magic or two of their friends play magic. And that's along the lines of like pacing, but you're doing it to one player now. Where what? You, of like we were talking about like pacing the game where it's like you're taking all this time. Now you've done it to one player where one player gets their turn is draw go. Oh, so like for the remainder of the game, it's like thirty percent, thirty percent, thirty percent, ten percent. The person you just ruined. Yeah, exactly. So they lose all their time playing because they don't get to play. They don't even get to interact or have anything. They're they done. They're card. They're you, they. You drew fourteen cards and discarded their hand on the land. You comboed off and you've discarded everything. I don't know. You know what Emrakul does? It's ridiculous. They yeah. they're out of the game. So what's the next thing we got here? The last thing is facilitate interaction, don't impede it. So the, there's cards that say players can't cast spells. Players can't do this. It's better to say players can do this than players can't do this. Yes. So preventing thing, a uh, good example of this, Teferi. Any version of any, uh, Not, not well, any version. Okay, Mage of Zalfir and Time Raveler are what we're mentioning. Well, specifically, where they say 
Players can't play spells except at sorcery speed. I, they don't say that. Exactly. Players can't play instants. Players can't interact with you. Players can't counter your spells. You can counter their spells. Ugh. Yeah, it's they're completely invisible. Rule of law can do the same thing. Where it's like, well, you put out a rule of law. It's a stacks piece basically, but you're impeding people from interacting as much because maybe you're 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 playing this stupid control deck. Well, not stupid. You're playing a control deck. I, I'm not trying to insult your deck. You're playing a control deck. You go rule of law. Leave up a counter. Co- Counter your only spell you can cast. Counter your only spell you can cast. Counter your only spell you can cast. Now, in, on your turn, draw like three cards with some card just, advantage engine. It just slows the game. It's going to slow the game, and I've seen plenty of board states where it doesn't even help the person who cast it. That's also it true. Just ends up, they just play it defensively, kind of like the desperate Armageddon that doesn't help anybody. Rule of Law sometimes doesn't help anybody. It's like, And that's not what you want. You don't want it helping nobody. Now this, this, these are cards next, the third, one of the, maybe the last category. Improving game quality, not just your game, but the game of four people. Yeah, and these are really interesting ones. And this I is sort of cards you can look at real quick. Just when it's, I've, yeah, I've watched videos before and I get frustrated because it's like they don't ever tell me what to add. They say what to cut, or they say these two clickbait things, and then they you know spin in a circle for a half hour. But this is like cards you could actually consider adding. Uh, I want well, we're gonna go over our list of like these few cards in a second, but I want to specifically. Ask you to comment these ones. What cards add more fun to the game? Because I know that there are more out there. That yeah, add- we can make this video a resource beyond what we're saying. If anyone has any sort of suggestions on awesome cards, fun strategies to do, put them in the comments. And then anyone watching who's wondering what else I could do, check the comments because other people are going to comment. Yeah, speaking of comments, if you want to see how you can really uh, impact with a comment, go to our worst commanders to play against, least fun. Uh, that comment that you pinned to the top, that were that, that guy who like I don't remember his name. I'm sorry. I'm sorry that I'm forgetting your name. But like you, he put like he, he did like a write up basically about. No, the, it wasn't the worst commander to play against. It was the best one one. For oh, one. it was the one one for one. Yes, but he did like he took the number one. He took the number one commander and he just built a deck and was like, hey, here's what I've learned or did. And there's a bunch of people who responded to it, so I pinned it at the top. Yeah, because it was it was just a super cool comment. You can like leaving comments like that is awesome. We love interacting with the fans, but. Let's get into these cards that improve game quality. We'll start with the monarchy. Any card it doesn't actually matter what it is that adds the monarchy to the game. This is putting more cards in the game. This is encouraging game action. It encourages game action without a ton of spite or malice. I want to check you for three. Why? Because you have the monarchy. Oh, yeah, that's fair. Can I have it next turn? Sure. Super cool stuff like that. Alliances and le- le- not even crazy alliances, like lesser alliances. Like, hey, want to bounce the monarch back and forth? Cool. We can kind of move the game forward instead of I'm going to attack somebody at random or I'm not going to attack anybody because I don't want to make anyone mad. But we're also, with these cards, we're not advocating group hug. None of these cards are like group hug. It was funny. The last time the monarchy was in the game for us, uh, I, I had I made a deal with BZ to give him the monarchy. Mm-hmm. And then uh, next turn, I'm like, all right, well, I will give you the monarchy. Or, or humble the factor. I'm like, well, I will give you humble the factor. And I had to like, and I had to like double back on my deal. I'm like, BZ. I need you to give Will Humble Defector. <laughs> I think if somebody else Humble Defector because of his thing. Anyway, the next sort of <laughs> mechanic or groups of cards, um, well, I don't think Monarch is group hug. It's definitely not. It's You can still build a deck trying to win that is a good deck that has Monarch cards in it. Yes. Uh, and, well, next thing, because I actually went into it without even yeah. thinking about it. I was trying to segue, but I just couldn't leave the Monarch. Uh, so Humble Defector adds a mini game to the game. There's other, there's another card that we'll go over in a second that does that. Also, Humble Defector is, it taps, you draw two, and then you it is gained control of by an opponent. But and you, you can only do it on your turn. But you only do it on your turn, so you can pass it around. You can pass in a circle to add more cards to the game, or you can again. This this is a card where alliances do happen, but try to avoid that. That's where this card gets unfun. Is when you start bullying with it. It's like if it goes, if there's four players, it goes. Player A gives it to C, gives it to D, gives it to A, gives it to C, gives it to D. It now can if player B is destroying them, maybe that's better for the game. That the resources are more balanced out. Maybe it's not. That's just general etiquette, though. Yeah, I mean, it, Humble Defector adds a mini game. It's not group hug. It's it is card advantage. It's not one of these janky Feldegriff things where you're just giving them stuff. You can leverage it and create advantage where some cards could never give you as much cards as Humble Defector. Yeah, at all. Uh, next one is Coveted Jewel, which is a five mana artifact, six mana artifact. Oh no, it's a six mana artifact. When it enters the battlefield, you draw three cards, and it taps for three mana. Uh-huh. It's kind of like a Guild of Lois, but Whatever a player deals combat damage to the player, if if you control this, then they gain control of it, they untap it, and they draw three cards. 
it's just going to be the most prized gem on the on the field. I would describe everyone's it, going to be attacking it. It's going to be very coveted. I would yeah, I would describe it as a coveted jewel. They yes. really named it correctly. Yes, because you're going to want to go for that. Why you get three cards and three mana? We've never even played with this card, but I I can see it and I know that it's similar space to those other things. It is. Until not, until we talked about it like yesterday, I would say it's probably my favorite magic card I've never considered putting in the deck. Where it's like, I, every other magic card where it's like, I love this card. I definitely want to put it. I never thought to put this in the deck. And now I'm like, I want this in the deck. This card is so cool. It looks like it creates different different games. You don't want to play the same game every time. That's not magic. Magic is different games every time. Yeah. More or less. Well, yeah. yeah. Uh, I mean, if your uh, playgroup hates these effects, don't include them. Talk to your playgroup. Yeah. Say, hey, what do you guys think about this? What do you guys think about... Humble Defector, and they're like, oh, I'm, I'm down. Put it in. Yeah, and, these are inher- and nothing in this list is inherently more fun. It's ways that we see to make more fun. I This one is just a good card. This card is great, and I would just recommend everyone play it because I love it so much. It's probably one of my favorite lands. I don't, I don't think it's more fun. I think it's just a good card. <laughs> it's a good card that has splash damage for fun. Gyre Reach Sanitarium. It's just a land, produces colorless mana. Two tap, each player draws a card, then discards a card. It progresses your game plan. If you're a graveyard deck, if you want to draw extra cards, if you want to discard extra cards, it allows every player to filter as just a bonus. If somebody's about to miss a land drop, you can leverage it, and you still get an effect. Yeah. See, this is just when I look at this, and it's like, yeah. Well, this isn't Miko Koro. This isn't just group hug. This is I want to do this. All right, I want to dredge an extra time on my land slot. I want to get it. I want to discard this land. You can use it to say, I'll activate it if you do this, and it just smooths out everyone's draws. While it still being better for you. Yeah. Um, some other ones. Great card. The, the ability Will of the Councils, which they actually didn't use as much as I thought they did in the original Conspiracy. What is that? Uh, it's where players vote. Starting with you, each player votes for two options on a card. And, or, well, usually there's usually there's two options. In some cases, you're voting for permanents, like with Council's Judgment, where starting with you, you vote for a permanent that isn't yours, and then each player does the same, but votes for a permanent that still isn't yours, the person who cast it. Yep, and the one with the most votes goes away. And the one with the most votes goes away. And if there's a tie, they both go away. So this cause this so you get to vote for like one thing. It might not even be what you want to get rid of that is gone by the end of this. But also you can team up if someone's sitting and play the seat over uh C D at the end, whoever gets the last word if there's can, a, can sort of backstab or create an alliance or you know make, make an action that Swings the game. Yeah, there can be a two and a one vote, and then you can be like, okay, well, I might as well get rid of two things instead of one thing. Coercive Portal and Magister of Worth, these are going to encourage conversation, and they're going to move the game forward, and in most cases, they're just going to create more fun. The They add layers to the game, much like, say, an onion. Uh, or an ogre. Yeah. Uh, but Coercive Portal, what it does is it's cool. It Everyone votes, I believe, on your upkeep or each upkeep. Yeah, they vote to either destroy everything or you draw an extra card. So probably you're drawing an extra card. Uh, I mean, it depends on where they're at. It's like a lot of players. And the best thing about this is you get a vote. And it's basically you, you're you going to vote to draw a card a lot of the time because you, you're you looking at making this a card advantage engine for you. All the other players have to agree to wipe the board. And if they hit, if one player has a good board, they're you, not going to wipe the board. Another card. You've added a layer to the game that is super fun. And it's not like these are the best cards ever. They're weaker than other options. You're going to have to give up some power. For fun. We're giving up power for fun. And like, again, these also might not be with your playgroup finds fun. It's all about finding what your playgroup finds fun. These are things that we've found are fun cards. I wouldn't confuse Council's... God, what is it? Will of the Council is different from Council's Dilemma. Council's Dilemma is way more lame. Uh, Or you choose... Everybody chooses something, and then you get X for every something. Yeah, because originally when I we started saying this, BC was like, oh, like Savala Stampede. I'm like, nope. Nope. Uh, Like Expropriate? Nope. <laughs> nope, because those cards completely say, uh, what busted thing do you want me to do? Well, yeah, what's what ridiculous mana advantage would you like this time? No. Yeah. Uh, okay, so next we have... Rem- Tweaking your removal okay. such that it provides more to the game of magic. So, explain it. Well, I was trying. Do you stop talking? <laughs> well, I thought I, you were going to say something. I was waiting for you. Double excuse. My excuses contradict each other. I don't even care. Playing spells to give your opponent's resources back introduces more to the game than just, let's say, swords for swords to plowshares. So instead of Nature's Claim, you could try Beast Within. Instead of Swords to Plowshares, you could try gift, uh, Generous Gift, or you could try both, mix them in, Chaos Warp, just something like uh, even the Imprison in the Moons. They give them something and these so are, that there's a little bit of a, a wrinkle in it. No. Don't Imprison, I think that that effect in Commander specifically, Imprison in the Moon, 
the forest thing in the in the indestructible bug are some of the most miserable effects in Commander because if you don't have a like you might have a way to interact with enchantments, especially if you're playing a blue black deck or a Grixis deck where you just what about arrest? Enchanted creature can't attack or block and its activated abilities can't be activated. Also just as miserable. All those, I think those cards are miserable. Like I feel so, on because, commanders though, but I, I, on anything else is fine. Yeah, no, I agree with that. I feel like they're fine on anything else, but when you put it on a commander. It just be in like the deck can easily like deck struggle to answer it. Some do. I think that can be a miserable thing. It can be. You just be careful. Yeah, if, I mean, if, if you're putting it on a green deck, if you're making a green a Galta, a uh, an enchantment, there, there's it's going to be tension because they could kill it. Yeah, exactly. But it, yeah, it's just that can take away fun. Make sure, make sure that those are cards I consider very unfun. Only on the commander. Only on the <laughs> specifically on the commander. I don't consider. But it's not the card. It's when your commander is nullified. It's not fun. Yeah, so it's not even the card. It's not. It's when you can't replay. Like your commander dying. Fine. That's perfectly reasonable. You can kill a commander all you want. Putting the commander. I also another thing I hate getting Emrakul and they choose to put your commander in your graveyard so it's no longer in the command zone. One of the most miserable things. I That's hate just that. a stupid random rules thing. Yeah, because they always choose. They can exile your commander or sacrifice and just keep it in the graveyard. Yeah, and that feels absolutely miserable. I cannot stand that rule. Dumb. Um, what's the next little bullet point we have? Uh, playing with restrictions can help players have fun based on their play styles and preferences. It might be something you want to try. Yeah, I don't know why. I don't know why. Yeah, I thought you were going to read the last six words. Uh, this is where me and BZ disagree. So you can start with your argument for because obviously. That That's not sense. an argument. It's well, just I, mean, I have fun with this. You don't seem to have as much fun with this. I like to start with a restriction when I'm building a deck and say, for example, I have a super competitive like Carador deck. It's borderline CDH slash I just play it with CDH decks. Well, I built another deck recently because I can't play that and I love Carador. So I built a second Carador deck and the only restriction is I can't play any cards that share a name with the first deck. So the deck has no soaring. It's got no busted, dumb tutors. It's kind of just scrapping and being a second rate deck and it's obviously worse in almost every way but every card i love is insanely fun it's all my pet cards and i have a ton of fun playing it because of the restriction i put on myself and i have various things like that so usually more often than not i will start with the restriction or a slight restriction and build towards it yeah um i think that players already come when you're building a deck you don't need to put extra restrictions because you you already have restrictions for deck building everybody does whether it be budget whether it be uh, what power level you want to be at. And I just, I never feel like the extra restriction that you're adding is necessary or adds more fun per se. It can in some cases for you, but for me, I've never experienced that. I've tried doing it at least once with a Bolas deck where I tried putting like, I want Bolas theme and I just, the deck wasn't fun to me because of how it played. It's like, it just had Bolas cards that set Bolas on them and then the cards sometimes did nothing and the restriction ended up making... It just seems like you don't like giving up power i don't mind it but but i do like my decks aren't built to be 100 percent. we already know that it's like if my decks are built oh, don't to... you only have one deck right now well because it, it's because of quarantine i've been wanting to build more decks i don't you could easily build a deck and have it together no i couldn't we have that we have more than enough cards for a trade biter deck i don't want to trade this is deck. the place for this i want to i don't like restrictions that much that's what that's where we're at well, well but it's just get the deck out and play it and then you can figure out what cards you need we, we, you can order our cards online that's why well, yeah, i'm trying not to i don't have that much cash it's quarantine kill my kill my pockets killing your vibe kill, anyway kill you can build with restrictions or you might not want to build with restrictions but that's one way if you want a challenge and you're looking for an achievement or a challenge start with a restriction maybe you don't if you don't want to uh, instead of a restriction specifically i like uh, challenge well the challenge of like your deck is going to be something and it's going to do something and then not trying to be like over the top with it by just putting in like tutors and everything you mean kind of like my warp world deck where my restriction was yes my challenge is win with warp world and that means you can't really play any instant sorceries yeah and you i think play that, these weird janky cards that put tokens in play i think that is a more interesting way to go about it uh and it kind so of to me it's all the same but there is a slight difference. There is, I think there is a difference between having a restriction of like only cards that cost $5 less. I feel like that's a huge restriction that I would not enjoy at all. Maybe. That's really random. I'm just saying. I just, that's how I feel about sure. it. Sure. Uh, so have an effective way to win. We talked about this earlier. You want to put the game away. Put the game away. I don't even want to go into details anymore because we already did don't this. Don't get us stuck in 90 to 90, 90% hell. Go. You're building up to it. You're building up to it. You win. Cool. Great. I'll take 99%. If I... Know that 99 times out of 100 my opponent's going to win, I'll be okay. When you're at 
when it's when it's nine out of ten times, that's when I don't want to scoop, when and it's, that's when it feels when I horrible. I can't scoop because I might not be dead. Yeah, but I'm dead. Especially when, especially if you're they're gold fishing over there, and it's like you might not be dead. And in your hands, you're sitting. You're like, I could probably win next turn. I've scooped because I just want to get to another game. Yep. And I don't want to be in this game that I'm in. Yeah, and you don't want games to end up like that because of you. Right. You don't want to be the guy doing that when you're when nobody. When everybody takes account for themselves and nobody wants to be the guy, nobody's the guy. And then the games get more fun. And uh, this next thing is something that I've heard a lot of play groups talk about. And I this, saw this last little piece. This of last little piece here. More? To make sure <laughs> that the game is progressing. And I want to start with the board wipe dilemma that comes up in a lot of play groups. Play groups like to play power down decks. And obviously, powering down your deck means you become more usually combat it, damage becomes more OP. Becomes it becomes more relevant. It, uh, usually people are cutting things like Cradle. If you want, you're gonna, the game's going to be slow. It's going to be grindy, and no one's in the combo off because players tend to remove combos in those type of decks. A board state where a 6-6 six, six is going to hit somebody three times. So, it, so what becomes super powerful in a meta like this is board wipes. And people never seem to have a problem with board wipes. And then they become the most powerful thing in the format because everything's based on creatures. It, it, it's, this, it's just a different version of the same boogeyman. Board wipes are now the... Protean Hulk thing that's ruining your games. Somebody has eight board wipes in their deck. I don't know. I've I play like three or less board but, wipes. I usually I don't really ever go above three. Even a, a controlling deck, I'll have like a tutor for a board wipe, but I don't I can't wipe the board four turns in a row. That's never a thing that I like can do. I haven't felt that I ever needed to, even in a heavy creature meta. I just I think it's bizarre to, yeah. to play like 10 board wipes. And I've heard people talk about uh, friends friends that play these games VDH where they sit down at the table with four people and basically everyone has a bunch of board wipes and then everyone plays a bunch of creatures, everyone wipes the board. Yeah. Everyone plays a bunch of creatures, they wipe the board and they end up playing... They put themselves into the... There's a sire of insanity in play except there isn't. Everyone just has to discard their hand and they're not getting more cards or doing anything to win. I remember like my friend told me they just play... They, when they play EDH, they play one long three-hour game. Right. And they've had to... They've had to change... How they play, they had to change the two at a giant because the games don't end. It's like, well, the games don't end because of deck building. The deck building, you can't, no, or someone's afraid to put it away, or you're more than welcome to kill me. That is totally acceptable. Let's go to the next game. I want to play more decks. I want to play this deck differently. I want to see if I can draw better. I just want to play more games and have more things happen. Yeah. Magic is a, is fun. I want to be playing. I don't want to be sitting there going, ah, we gotta, nothing's happening. Well, he's got two tokens. Better wipe the board. <laughs> Ugh. Please. Yeah. Please. Don't just. And it's not like you shouldn't board wipe if there's a bunch of creatures in play, but if that keeps happening and all that ever happens is a bunch of creatures in play, board wipe, bunch of creatures in play, board wipe, maybe you should up your play style. Find a way to get around it because that's going to force them to change their decks too. Because you hit the, the point. meta evolves. When nobody's doing anything meaningful, if everything is just play creatures, board wipe, play creatures, board wipe, then the game hasn't progressed. Yeah. The game is is just stale. It's up, to you. it's up to you at that point to find a way around that. Say, oh, well, now if you keep board wiping, you're going to die because my creatures are going to deal damage to you. Find some way. If that's the if that's your meta, find some way to make your deck different so that your deck's going to start winning and they're going to have to adjust Well, yeah, if, and, if that's your problem. But yeah, but then there comes the problem that like nobody wants to – like I, I uh, somebody said that. What? That in their playgroup, nobody wants to win. It's like, well, why do you – I don't understand. I, I understand wanting to hang out with your friends, but I – I want to hang out with my friends and also play a game that I want to try and win. It's like, I don't I just don't, I'm I gonna do not understand that. Commander is a social game and I like, you know, shooting the breeze while we're talking or while we're playing. And sometimes playing is secondary, but I would like some sort of weight on the game at all. Yeah. I, I mean, otherwise, let's just lay out our decks and say, here, look at my cool deck. I could do this or this. And that's the same thing. Yeah. Right? If, if the game has no weight and the game means absolutely nothing, then the game's not worth playing. The game, I mean, the, winning. Is I don't care who wins. It's just kind of I want. There's a goal. There has to be something we're working towards. Otherwise, I, I don't. I don't get. It. I okay. I would like to say this. I think this is a specific. This is definitely way more my opinion than most people. I decks should be geared and made to be able to win. There are a lot of decks made that aren't that aren't able to win. I don't think group fun. Uh, I don't think group hug is a very fun thing to bring to a regular EDH table. There's. There's a, I mean, you can play that group hug. Like, Nekusar isn't a group hug deck. That's, that's going to give people resources and kill them. Well, it's, just, that's group stuff. I'm saying don't <laughs> just give them stuff. Take advantage of it or something. I, I don't think it's fun when everybody has 25 cards in hand. I don't, that's another way to make the game go 
turtle pace. Nothing's going to happen because everyone has everything. I don't want to sit down at the table with a Fallout Griff deck. I just don't. I would not be interested in that game. I One of my least favorite – another one of my least favorite things in Commander is Kingmaking. When people are Kingmaking, it drives me insane. That is another way to suck the fun out. I would, I would avoid Kingmaking unless all four of you like it. Then I, my opinion has no weight to that. But before we just start rambling because we're not on well, script, there's no script left. Well, because I'm talking about uh, – I. And sometimes I might make my decks too too good because like I, I end up putting all the tutors in and stuff because I want to have a deck that can win. I don't like sitting – I never – You're just scared of not winning and you want to – you maybe overcompensate, you're saying? Uh, no. I, it's not that I'm scared of not winning. I, I'm i scared – my least favorite games of EDH are when I sit down and I can't win. If I get to a point in the game where I feel like I'm 1% to win, that gets miserable. It's like when I play Torbrand – Oh, you built the Torbrand deck? It's like the deck was fun when it was doing what it was doing. Sometimes but then Torbrand somebody dies twice and then you can't win. Then somebody plays a board wipe and you go, well, now I'm dead. And yeah. It's like, I'm actually dead. I can't. The odds of me winning this game are astronomical. That it's is like, frustrating. I don't like playing those games. And that's why I want my deck to be better to like right to, at that, like up near that 90% so I can have a chance to win. That's what we think about it. I think that's, we that's what's got f- to say everything we wanted to say. That is what's uh, fun for me. That is. Almost every possible piece of advice we can give you on how to improve your deck's fun quality, how to maybe downshift your deck, what to switch out, you know, take out card A and put in card B, that sort of thing. I think that if you want to add anything to this video, you can do it in the comments. Also, I'd you, love to talk to you. You just mentioned downshifting. Downshifting isn't the only way to be more fun. I think if you're that tool of a power level, that's us being fun and you want to upshift your decks a little bit. Maybe if you've been playing. Great example. We built Pauper EDH decks years ago. It was the worst format I've ever played in my entire life. You could not do anything. Oh. It was just 30 creatures against 30 creatures because there was no board wipes and no combos and no anything. It was, so there's a there's a limit to that. There's, yeah, exactly. There is a limit to that. If, if your power level is too low, that like, and that's that's like the bottom of the barrel where it's like that is way too low to be any fun. You got to find the balance. There is a balance in between 100% find competitive decks. A and pauper EDH. Let's do the end of the video thing. Uh, the end of the video. So, special shout outs to all of our patrons. We love you all as much as we can without making you uncomfortable. If you would like to join them and support us, you can head over to patreon.com forward slash user forward slash and picking nerds. And while you're there, pick one of our awesome tiers, get those awesome perks. Join us. Talk to us for realsies you in the Discord. You can't say join us. Another YouTube channel has that. What? Well, I said it. No, you can't say it. I, it's in the video. No, anyway, stole it. two other ways to support the channel. You can go to TCG Player, link in the description. Buy whatever you want from the site, navigate where you want to go, and we get a kickback on the order. Also, you can go to Buy Me a Coffee, Digital Tip Jar. I don't even think we need to elaborate on that anymore. No, no. Just Digital Tip Jar. Wife. If someone doesn't know what a tip jar is, Google it. Yeah, and obviously we understand that most people in this time, it's tough to support anybody because it's you know, no, trying to support yourself. You're saying it wrong. In these uncertain times... The nitpicking nerds are committed to doing the thing that we already do for money. <laughs> wow. We're here for you. You just called out so many things, and I don't I don't know if I'm comfortable. Peace out, Tribe Scout. <laughs>